So uh, do me a favor. Everyone take their cell phone out and put it to silent, please. My name's Mike Fowler. I'm the acting director of Outreach and Communications for the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. I'd like to welcome you all here. I'd also like, who are here in the room, and I'd also like to welcome the people that are watching us virtually. We're pleased to see you again, as we always are. Hopefully one day you won't have to be here, but we are pleased to see you because we know many of you for many years. Um, couple administrative notes. On your table, there are a list of restaurants that are in the area uh, for our break. Um, can you pull up the agenda, please? All right, you see the agenda slide here. I'm not gonna read through it for you. Uh, the notable thing is we will have a lunch break from 11.30 to 1.30. Translate that military time for you. And then we will do uh, a question and answer from 3.30 to 4.30 this afternoon in this room. And um, with that, uh, everybody look at their folder. I presume everyone has checked in upstairs with their service casualty offices. You also hear people we love acronyms, we'll call them SCOs. I call them the casualty offices. So, but if you have any questions, uh, please see them and they will get you situated. If you look in your booklets that everyone has, on the left hand side, I believe it is, is you will see a survey. Please fill those out. Uh, you can kind of fill it out as you go along following the briefings. We do take this stuff very seriously and we try to make changes and improve the program based on your feedback. And you also have a copy of the slides. If you can't see them or you want to jot notes down, they will also be posted online after the fact. And you also have another schedule to uh, refer to. All right. Those of you who are able to, please stand for the arrival of the colors and the singing of the national anthem by Senior Master Sergeant Emily Wellington. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red That our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Come. Right shoulder off. Guard, right step. 
And now I'd like to introduce Chaplain Victoria Reeves. I invite you to bow your heads with me. Creator, thank you for gathering us together for the next two days to first honor our loved ones still missing from a war fought not that long ago. May these in attendance create new bonds with daughters, sons, cousins, friends, aunts, uncles, and other important people around them. Grief is nearly impossible to bear alone, but grant these an opportunity and space to share their individual stories with others who understand like no one else can. Allow us to learn from them and share and even help carry their burdens and expectantly hope to say, welcome home. Thank you for the opportunity to hear from experts such as the Department of Defense, the Defense Intelligence Agency, research from the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, and more. I pray these moments are restful, informative, honoring, and connecting. Thank you for the passion and tireless work of the DPAA, from ex excavations to those who plan events such as this. Their efforts do not go unnoticed. I also pause for an appreciation of a strong connection with our Asian partners. Help us see how deeply connected we all are and guide conversations towards healing. In your name I pray, amen. <coughs> Thank you very much. Now we're going to start our remembrance ceremony. I draw your attention to the back of uh, your program booklet. can kind of focus your thoughts on what you would like to say. This is your opportunity to get up and tell us a little bit about your loved one, why you're here. These gentlemen with the microphones in the uniform will have microphones. Please raise your hand and they will come to you. I ask that you keep the microphone close to your mouth so that we can, it'll transmit and everyone will be able to hear you. Who's gonna be the brave individual that's gonna go first? Good morning, everybody. My name is Maureen Hickman Caparasso. I am the one of four daughters of United States Air Force Captain Vincent J. Hickman, who was a navigator with the Air Force and was killed on January 14th of 1964, 60 years ago. My mother just turned 90 yesterday, and we would like some answers. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Robert Hess. I'm the youngest brother of um, Frederick Hess Jr., United States Air Force, shot down in Laos, March 29, 1969. He was backseater of an F-4 Phantom, and his parents are gone. His wife died a year and a half ago, and there's now a marker in Arlington, but the questions remain, and like her, I'm here for answers. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Heather Hoskins Henry. Um, I have never attended, and I'm, I'm in awe of this. Um, and I'm sorry if I stumble or get a little emotional. Um, my father was um, shot down over Laos in 1971, and I was 17 months old. And um, he was in the Air Force and flew F-4s. I didn't really know much about this story as my family kind of sh um, sheltered me from it and took care of my mother. She had, you know, quit college um, to marry him, and, um, and we were living at, you know, Air Force bases, and um, she didn't have a job, and we were living with my grandparents at the time that he was overseas. And so she had, you know, no job, no college degree, no home, really, and a 17-month-old. She's doing well. We live in Connecticut now. Um, I grew up with just her. I have no siblings. Um, I was blessed to have three sons, married an amazing man. Um, so I want to believe there's a higher power that he was looking out for me and has a wicked sense of humor that he thinks I can handle three boys. 
<laughs> but our oldest is in the Army now. He actually attended West Point, which was not a great fit for him. So now he is currently enlisted um, and in San Antonio in medic training and really wishing him the best because that's been tough too. Um, but very hard. When he told me he wanted to go to West Point, I actually said, do you hate me? <laughs> because I was, he has actually worn my dad's bracelet um, since he was like 14. He was very motivated by my father's story. I've had many interesting stories happen over the years. The closest I got to um, the Air Force was I was a flight attendant for about 18 months. Definitely not cut out for that job. I was a terrible flight attendant. <laughs> But I'm now currently a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, and I think for obvious reasons, because it's deeply affected me, and I want to help others. Um, I'm not sure what else I can tell you, but thanks for listening, and I'm really happy to see people in this scenario. I've never met anyone else um, in this, with his stories. So, thank you. Thank you. Anyone? Oh, this gentleman right here. Wait for a microphone, please. Oh, go ahead, sir. Sorry, it's hard for me to see with these lights. I'm Nick Dwyer, uh, and I have 30 years behind me in the military. I uh, was sent to Vietnam in 1967. Excuse me, 1966. My brother-in-law who I'm here representing, was in Vietnam in, from 65 to 66. The night before he was shot down over Laos, I was with him. We talked about what he might try and spy and see when he was there. So sure enough, he went out and never came back. He was shot over Laos, shot down. In fact, picked him up on radio. They were in good condition, there was two of them. And they were trying to evade. And we found out since that the North Vietnamese colonel that was uh, heading up the re resupply and rest area on the way in from uh, North Vietnam to South Vietnam on Ho Chi Minh Trail said if you cannot get them alive, shoot them. They got shot. And they've been there ever since. April 6, 1966, on April 7th, his boss called me up and said, would you come down to Saigon? I want to talk to you. And that's when I found out that he had been uh, shot down. And all they knew is that at, the, at that time, they were missing. And we've been following this ever since. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Hi, I'm here on behalf of my missing husband, Michael W. McAndrews, who was a warrant officer and a pilot. I'm very happy to be a pilot after training with helicopters. And we were just sure he would come back. In actuality, only, he, his, only his plane went down and all those helicopters came out fine. So. Good luck to his classmates. Um, I came to one of these about 50 years ago. Yes, I am that old. And he, I, I, it broke my heart to open the first page of the book, and I was just a sobbing mess and never came back. I kept in touch, and then last month, my, just as my father passed away, he was a World War II officer, I got an email. And here's where the hope part comes in. Some fisherman in Vietnam was dragging a net, and pulled up, um, and it got caught on something. So he got another friend of his, and they went out to see what was in that net. And as it turns out, it is a part of my husband's plane. So now we know exactly where that plane is. So I'm here because 
I was told that you have a lot of archaeologists who can go dig up, but not too many divers. So if any of you want to go learn how to dive or anything, we could, they could use them. <laughs> but um, so I'm here just kind of as the squeaky wheel to hope that now that you know exactly where he is, this great fisherman found him, we could bring him back. He has a son, and that's the end of our family. So um, if any of you could help, you know, with me, uh, see me, you know, tapping on your shoulder, you know anybody can go get him, that's, I'd like to have him back. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, my name is Cynthia. My father was um, Warren Officer Donald R. Sagert. He flew Hueys. His uh, KAC killed in action date was June 10, 1965. Um, I have my husband, Steve, and two of his uh, grandchildren and great-granddaughter here uh, just to be here in case, hopefully, when the, he does get to come home, that there is someone in the family to receive him. I just want to thank you all for your efforts. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name is Steve Morrissey. I'm here with my wife, Jenny. Uh, I'm the uh, only surviving son and primary next of kin of uh, Colonel Robert David Morrissey, Jr. Oh, I'm sorry, that's my brother. Uh, Colonel Robert David Morrissey, uh, presumed killed in action November 7, 1972. Uh, my dad served three tours in Vietnam. He flew C-130s. Uh, F-4s, and then his casualty was in the F-111. Uh, he was in the 427th Tactical Fighter Squadron of the 430th Tactical Fighter Wing stationed in Nellis Air Force Base, Las Vegas. Um, and uh, my family's been involved in this uh, since, uh, the obviously, uh, since 1972. Uh, my mom was... Uh, active in the formation of the League of Families, and uh, uh, both my mom and my brother have passed on. Uh, my mom is now buried in Arlington under the marker that uh, uh, there memorializes my father's casualty. And I'm uh, just uh, grateful for the efforts of uh, the government, and uh, uh, we've had a long and often strained relationship with all the different entities that. Uh, serve us in this uh, uh, in this effort and uh, and and uh, we're not always happy with the with what we get from them but we are always grateful for the uh, uh, for their efforts and for their uh, uh, commitment to resolution of this issue thank you sir Go ahead. My name is uh, Dorothy Morris. Uh, I'm here for my brother, uh, First Lieutenant Michael Miller. He was uh, killed March 28, 1969. Uh, for years, I did not know the truth. I was given conflicting information. It took me 35 years, much uh, with help from my late husband, who was an F-4 pilot in the same squadron, locating the forward air controller as well as the general who was commander of the wing at the time, uh, those who witnessed what had happened uh, and found out much of the conflicting information what had actually happened. I did this as a civilian. It was 2002 or 2001, the last time someone went to the exact crash site. Nothing has been done since. Uh, I get the same report year after year with no changes. Uh, I have to say I'm very disillusioned. I'm watching all of us age. I'm the last one of my family. I'm going to be 76. I will be passing this along eventually to my own children who never knew my brother. And I find that rather sad. So I wanted to let you know my feelings on this, which may be different from some of yours. I hope eventually there will be some uh, conclusion to this. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, my name is Maggie Ogden Artery. I'm here with my niece, Carolyn Wolf from Phoenix, and we're here representing my, my little brother, Howard Ogden Jr. Um, 
a loss in October 1967 in South Vietnam. Um, I'm thankful for all the work that DPAA has been doing on my brother's case and feel sorry for the woman that just spoke. Um, my, my brother's case is active and I really look forward to bringing my little brother home soon. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mark Morrison. I was stationed in Vietnam in 1966. And on October 24th, I received a letter from my brother. At that time, he was Captain Glenn R. Morrison, United States Air Force, graduate of the Annapolis Naval Academy in 1959. Glenn advised me in that letter that he was in Vietnam, and I went to my <clears throat> commanding officer in Chulai and asked if there was a chance I could visit my brother. He said, by all means, and he lined me up with a civilian aircraft to fly me from Chulai to Phan Rang. I arrived in Phan Rang on October 25th. 1966, about 1,400. I asked a follow me Jeep driver, an Air Force uh, NCO, I believe, if he knew where the 614th Tactical Fighter Squadron was located. He pointed to a Quanta hut about <laughs> a half a mile away. He says, it's over there. I said, uh, can you give me a lift? He says, why don't you walk, Marine? I said, listen, you SOB, I need, I need to see my brother. When I got to 614th Tactical Fighter Office, it was a Quonset hut, the long aisle with doors on either side. And it opened up to an area, uh, and I could see a lot of brass. Now remember, I'm only 19 years old, a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps. And I walked down, the officer says, uh, what do you want, Marine? I said, I'm here to visit my brother. I said, who that might be? I said, Captain Morrison. Well, he's in a meeting. He says, stand over there. And, uh, yes, sir. Uh, about 15 minutes later, I hear a door open, a lot of feet shuffling. And a bunch of pilots come walking up that highway. And uh, my brother was the last one. We hadn't seen each other for two years, but we were awful close. Glenn was 10 years older my hero of my life. I said, Glenn, he looked over and didn't recognize me. The last time he saw me, I was at 204 pounds. This time I was weighing 134 pounds thanks to a diet of sea rations and uh, Dysentery. <laughs> Marine Corps didn't eat that well. Oh, of course. Oh. We hugged. And the officer suggested that we go out and have some pictures taken. Glenn says, I'm not giving those goddamn commies pictures of two brothers from Iowa that are here in Vietnam together. Well, this commanding officer's kind of insisted. And so he said, okay. We proceeded out to the tarmac I had pictures taken. I 
run his F-100D. And as he was doing his inspection, I walked along around with him. I, being an ammunition technician, knew about the armament on the plane. And Glenn took off to a sortie and came back. And he says, well, let's, let's go get some dinner, but you can't come with me. He says, you're in Marine Corps uniform, you're not an officer. So they hunted around and found some civilian clothes that I could get into and wrap around my waist a couple times and cinch up with my Marine Corps belt. We went to the officers club and had a good steak dinner. Although I was only 19 years old, I had some damn good scotch that night. I tried to talk Lennon to going home. He had a wife and three daughters. I said, because of Sullivan Act, I can stay here and you go home. He says, Mark, this is my career. I have a chance to be a test pilot. Why don't you go home? He says, I got a sortie in the morning and then we have five days together we can spend. He said, there was an IG inspection going on and the, that I could just wait in his Quonset hut and he'd be back around 0930, 10 Well, I woke up at five as he was going out the hatch, the door. I said, Glenn, he turned, said, good luck. He gave me a thumbs up, closed the door. Little did I know, that was our last chance to speak with each other. This is my first meeting, and it's very difficult. I wrote a letter home to mom and dad, said we were together. And not worry about us, we'll be good. And I waited. About 11 o'clock, an officer comes in. He says, oh, you're still here. I said, yeah, I'm waiting for Glenn. He said, oh, he'll probably be here shortly. I don't know if he was checking to see if I was there or, or what. But I'm reading either a Life magazine or a post, I'm not sure which it was, sitting between two bunks on a chair, and uh, the door opened, and I saw a lot of brass. Excuse me, officers, but I jumped to attention, and I said, carry on. I sat down and buried my head in this magazine because I was sure this was the IG inspection. An officer sat right directly in front of me, one on my left and one on my right. I look to my right and I see a cross on a collar. Immediately, I knew something was wrong. They told me my brother is missing in action. I stayed five days. My other brother, a graduate of West Point in 1960, was at the Pentagon. He and I spoke several times while I was there. After five days, I flew back to Da Nang and then 
to July the following morning. Told my CEO what happened. And he said, you're going home. I had an hour and a half to check out. It was 124 degrees in July. 36 hours later, I landed in Mason City, Iowa, my hometown. I got off the plane still in dungarees, or utilities as the Marine Corps called them. I did get my boots shined and a shave in Hawaii. Nineteen sixty, excuse me, nineteen seventy-nine. The Air Force advised my family and Glenn's wife that they declared Glenn dead. I'm here to find out more. Thank you. I thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My name is Frank Platt. I'm the cousin of John Floyd Hummel. He was a Cobra pilot. He was in B Troop, 7th of the 1st, and the closest thing I had to a brother, and I'm here representing him. And first of all, he's, he was not specifically MIA. He was a POW, and, and we've recently found that out. I'm here with the, the, guy, the family of the guy in the front seat, Bill Milliner, and his brother and sister-in-law, and we're here to see some answers off the case. I'm also with his roommate with B Troop, Vic Massant, who has a lot of facts that relate to the case. But the one thing I was kind of curious, this is kind of a question of the people here. How many of the people here are aviation related helicopters? I'm sure there's a few. If you get the chance, contact the VHPA. They might be able to connect you with some of the people that serve with your family member. You might be able to get more information that way. And part of the story I'm going to talk, talk about has to do with that. It happened this, this May, because I've noticed a lot of people here doing the same thing. They have a, a Gold Star breakfast. I sat down at a table with people I did not know at all and started eating breakfast, and somebody mentioned his class that he went through at Fort Walters. And I said, is that Johnny's class? Is that Johnny's class? And I asked the guy, do you know John Hummel? He looked at me kind of funny and said, who's that? And they had a flyer and had his picture was on the cover of it. It says, this guy right here. And he looked at it and he reached over, uncovered his wrist. <laughs> he was wearing Johnny's bracelet. <laughs> he was not in his unit. He didn't throw him, but he was wearing his bracelet. 500 people were sitting in the room and I happened to sit down to somebody wearing his bracelet. And to me, that was extremely important. It keeps the word out, the message out that we still have people missing and need to be found. I'll be honest with you, I don't wear the bracelet. I, mainly because I wore it as a kid, I went through five bracelets in two years. I worried the thing until they would break, would have to replace it, and so I decided I would not wear it because I couldn't keep it tight. But hopefully we're gonna get some answers this year and find something, because if somebody stated we're getting older, and it's gonna be the same where the people representing the next to Kim won't even have a clue who the person was. But we hope there's answers for everybody this year. Thank you. Good morning. It's, it's good to see some familiar faces, but I know there are a lot of people in here. That is your first time. My heart goes out to you. It's tough. Um, I'm representing the families of Lima Side 85. If you're not familiar with Lima Side 85, it was a um, radar base, secret radar base on top of Pupati in Laos where we were not supposed to be, but we were. And they were all doing what they did best. On the eve of 3-11-68, they were attacked and 11 people were lost. I'm not saying all 11 people were lost. Some of them made it off, I believe. Some of them didn't, but I do feel the need to say their names right now. Lieutenant Colonel Blanton, James Calfee, who was my uncle, 
Melvin Holland, Rick Holland's dad. Rick is somewhere. I'm not sure where, but he's here. Patrick Shannon, his remains have been identified. Donald Springstetta, Willis Hall, here's his brother, his dad, excuse me. James Davis, Henry Gish, Herbert Kirk, Don Worley, these are his two children, and his brother, and David Price. Save David till last because the very special thing happened to David this week. His remains were identified 56 years after the fact. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning. My name's Kay Hall. This is my wonderful friend, Carolyn. Hendricks, Carolyn Hendricks. Um, we've been friends for a long time. Our husbands were shot down over D N D Nang in 1972. Um, we, we've been so close since then, and we are looking uh, to hope to find remnants of the plane or something in the bay. It's a very easy find, the way we understand it, especially now with the photography, the underwater photography that they've been, use, they've been using and are starting to use. We hope the DPAA can help us with that. We have a gentleman named Ed Sykes here. He was an Air Force friend with Carolyn's husband when, um, when they flew one, he would, Carolyn's husband was there for his second tour. The first tour, he was there in 104s, 105s, 105s. And um, Ed Sykes back here is a wonderful friend. He's a retired Air Force gentleman, and he is helping to try and find information and get a little search, a water search, for our husbands. Um, my husband was on his second tour also. He was an RB-66 and they flew together, together in an F-111, uh, and he, they were lost on sep no, November 21st, yeah, 1972. And, and, that, and their names are Ron Stafford and Charles Caffarelli. They were wonderful husbands, and Carolyn and I both have, uh, we had two babies, really two very small, small children when they went the second time and didn't come home. And um, we're very proud of our husbands and we've made our children, and this is one of them. This is Carolyn's daughter, Dawn. Uh, we were very proud of our children. We tried to do the best we can with them and they're very pro-military and they would love, we would love to see something found by the time because Carol and I are not any young chicks anymore. <laughs> that was 55 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm, my name is Steve Merrick, and I'm the son of Charles Weldon Merrick. And uh, uh, I just want to say uh, uh, he, he was a uh, service member flying A6 off of VA-65. Uh, he went down on June 25th, 1966, uh, and uh, uh, it's wonderful to hear all your stories, and uh, I'm th very thankful for the DPAA. Uh, I was very young at the time, unfortunately, uh, like one of the other speakers, uh, I was about 18 months when he passed away. Uh, but in any way, uh, I'm very thankful to be here, and very thankful to hear all your wonderful stories. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Veronica Crawford. I have a daughter named Shante Butler. Um, her father, Dewey Renee Butler, was a private and became a corporal, but he went down in July 69. Uh, he was the gunner on the helicopter. Um, he passed away July the 4th, well, my name, MIA, the 14th of July, and I had her on the 20th, so she never knew him. 
And my baby's having a hard time this whole 55 years. She wants something from him. And if he would bring remains, it will help her. My child is dying, and I can't help her. Thank you, ma'am. Howdy. I'm Karen E. Forrester. I'm the very proud daughter of Captain Ronald W. Forrester. He was shot down, he's a Marine, shot down over North Vietnam, December 27th of 72, part of Operation Linebacker 2. I have been coming to these meetings for years. Uh, some of you are like family to me, so it's always great to get together. But for all the people that I'm hearing are first timers, we're so glad that you're here. Heather, hearing you say you'd never met anyone else. I remember meeting MIA, fam MIA family whose last name didn't match mine when I was 14. And that really changed a lot for me because there's a lot of isolation when no one else is in your position. So welcome and welcome to all of you that are here for the first time. Please make sure in your case review, set one up and ask any question that you want. That is your time. There's no dumb question. And just stick with this, y'all. Um, it gets frustrating, I know, as a family member, but I'm here to tell you, we got an answer. My dad was identified after 50, 50 years, three weeks before 51. And getting that call, I was shocked. And I mean, it's still pretty surreal. And it's amazing, and I want it for all of you. I will continue to come and work this mission with you because we still got work to do, and I want to see the answers all of you are asking for to come to fruition as well. Just don't give up and keep, keep the hope going. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brian Danielson. My dad was... Uh, December 5, 1969, over Mugia Pass in Laos, part of Boxer 2-2. Uh, there's a lot of people who knew what that was. My last convention was in 2006 when uh, I debriefed uh, my chance to go with JPAC to Laos to find my dad. As far as I know, I was the only son of an MIA who was allowed to go on that because uh, they decided afterwards that they didn't think they want that, wanted that program to happen anymore. And I think that was a mistake of JPAC, but I was really proud to be able to have the access and to go with the teams and dig for my dad. We didn't find anything. Uh, I gave my brief here and then drove to Andrews and was in Iraq for another uh, tour. But um, I just would like to say uh, uh, in that tour from Iraq, they found some remains that were identified and, and uh, they, they were identified as my dad and we helped bring him home. Yeah. I'm getting old and emotional, but um, I just wanted to tell you that uh, uh, I can't promise you get answers, but uh, God tends to have things happen in the way they're supposed to happen. And if I... If I learned anything through that process, I learned uh, as alone as I felt. Well, when we brought my dad home, I realized how many people were there for us. And uh, to all of you, uh, I'm just hit with... this wave of emotion remembering what it was like. And wanting you to know that there are people there who understand and support you and pray for you. And uh, God bless you all on your journeys. If there's anything I can do to help, um, uh, I'm only more uh, boldly supportive of you than I ever have been in, in my life before. And uh, God bless you all in your journeys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm Jane Klingner, now Adams. My first husband... Captain Michael Lee Klingner was an F-100D pilot shot down over the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. Um, within a week, couple weeks of his being shot down in 1970, April, uh, I received a letter that looked like Sybil Stockdale had 
typed it out at her Smith Corona at the kitchen table, inviting family members of the MIAs and POWs to come to the first meeting of this group in Washington, D.C. in May 1970. Um, the Air Force flew four of us from Offutt Air Force Base, um, one POW wife, two MIA wives, and an MIA sister from Offutt to this meeting. Um, momentous. We were finally realized it wasn't doing us any good to stay quiet about our lost loved ones. We had to get active which you have done. Um, Mike received the Distinguished Flying Cross for his action in rescuing uh, ground troops, American ground troops who were pinned down by the VC in South Vietnam. It makes me so proud and happy to think of the men who did return to raise families because of Mike's action. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Amy Stewart, and I'm here because I'm the daughter-in-law of Lieutenant Colonel John F. Stewart, United States Air Force B-52 aircraft commander, shot down December 20th, 1972. I wanted to share with you how important it was when uh, my husband and I came to our first meeting and made those family connections. I'm here because he's no longer available to take this mission forward. His son has stepped into that position. Very proud of that Marine, but he's active duty. So I stand alongside him to continue our mission. And this is, this is the legacy, and it's not a legacy anybody wants, but it is, we need those answers because this is not a legacy, just not one you want to pass down. But I wanted to share with you that it's important that we continue the mission, we continue looking for those answers, and representation is the best way to do that and to stand there and be involved and ask your questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I didn't want to put my back, put any of you behind my back, so I did what the last lady just did. I was out taught not to have people looking at your back. My name is Patricia Ann Mitchell Perry. I am the widow of Chief Warrant Officer Otha Lee Perry, killed December 14, 1971, in Vietnam. My husband loved military life. He started out as a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division. Then he went to Special Forces Unit. Then he decided he wanted to fly. And he loved flying. He actually, I was told, volunteered for the third tour of duty in Vietnam. I wasn't happy about it. But I loved my husband, and I know he wanted to do this. His airplane was not shot down. It actually exploded, and for what I have received from the military, it's that black box report that shows that the engine on his plane caught fire and exploded in midair over the South China Sea. Christmas has never been the same to me because for them to come to me and let me know what happened that close to a very special holiday just took the meaning away. But year after year, dealing with my God in my life, I can celebrate it again. If you ever see me anywhere on my shoulder, you will see a butterfly. I wear a butterfly every day. It reminds me of Ofa. He's always with me. He's looking out for me. And I appreciate 
what the military is still doing. In fact, I asked several years ago, why are you still searching for parts or whatever you can find? We're talking about 1971, and we're looking at now 2024. I thank you for everything that you're trying to do. I'm an active Gold Star wife. I do a lot with the Gold Star families. And at my church, I am in charge of every Memorial Day and Veteran Day celebration that come on because we have lots of vets in our church. I thank you for continuing to do the things you do for all of us. I celebrated my 80th birthday and I was 31 when my husband was killed. I thank God for still being around here to do this. And I pray each and every day for all of you. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Sorry for the noise outside. Uh, go ahead. Hey, everybody. I'm Michael McPherson. I am the grandson of Tanis Emil Khalil, who uh, was captured with two other gentlemen on their way to work uh, February 8, 1969. They were all Lear Siegler uh, employees, helicopter mechanics, going to deliver checks to their... Uh, the comrades out in the bases in the hinterland. And uh, they didn't make it. They got, they got grabbed by a Viet Cong element and uh, were dragged into the jungle. Four years and four days later, four men were released. Two of them were his comrades that were captured that day. James Fritz, or John Fritz, James Newingham, uh, Doug Ramsey, and Special Forces Captain William Hardy. They came home and told the story of my grandfather dying in captivity in the arms of James Fritz. James Fritz. I'm going to ask everybody to, uh, to pray for my family today. It's a, it's a rough day. Uh, Grandpa Tommy has a lot of grandchildren that never got to meet him. He left behind uh, four sons, the youngest of which, his only child, died uh, the Saturday before last. Today is Joseph Khalil's birthday. He did not reach 23 years old. So he was very curious about what happened to Grandpa Tommy, and I'm so glad that I was able to, to have folks like you at my disposal that helped us do the research. So glad for the folks at DPAA and our research analysts that, that provided a whole bunch of information, including possibly the last picture of Grandpa Tommy ever taken alive. Please pray for our family today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Maura Walsh. My father was uh, Colonel Richard Ambrose Walsh. He was a Sky Raider pilot. He was um, Sandy One on a mission to rescue a downed pilot in Laos on February 15th, 1969. Um, as Sandy One, his job was to locate the downed pilot and um, uh, fly low and slow to uh, draw fire and um, take out enemy guns so that the helicopters could hoist the down pilot up. Well, in the course of that work, he himself was shot down. And um, on February 15th, 1969, in near Chipone in Zikon province, my father's crash site is known. Um, it's a two-part crash site. Um, there was a, the current theory is there was a last-minute attempt to punch out in the Yankee extraction system. So 
they've found the Yankee extraction system artifacts, and that would be where his remains would be. Um, but um, they haven't fully excavated that part of his crash site. So I applaud uh, everyone here who has the same sense of duty that my dad did and encourage you to excavate locus B of my father's crash site, which is where he is. Thank you for your sense of duty. Thank you, ma'am. I'm assuming that the uh, people outside are going to give us a little respect. Um, I'm the youngest of uh, four siblings. My oldest brother, uh, our mother had passed away when I was three, and he had just turned 15. His name was Chief Master Sergeant Charles Douglas King. And uh, he wasn't a pilot in the Air Force, so he didn't have to know all of those sophisticated things that a pilot needed to know. <clears throat> but he had to train for a year and a half for his job. And his job was to be lowered into the jungle <clears throat> and save the pilots. <laughs> they were called uh, PJs, pararescue men, and uh, there was only one of them that went down. One, one went down for each pilot, and they were lo lowered 100 feet from a jolly green giant to the ground. He was there for um, 10 months. In 10 months, he got his uh, orders to come home because in 10 months, he had completed 75 rescue missions. In that 10 months, he received the Air Force Cross, Silver Star, Distinguished Flying Cross, the Air Medal with one Oak Leaf Cluster, and of course, the Purple Heart. So, before he became a hero in the Air Force, he was my, my hero, my big brother, who took, took care of me after our mother passed away. In the mid-90s, um, although he was rescuing a pilot about 45 miles southeast of Dong Hoi, North Vietnam, they found his airman card and his Geneva Convention card in pristine condition in a Hanoi War Museum. This was in the 90s. And still to this day, we can't figure out how that, how the, those two cards got into that museum. And uh, there was some Vietnamese writing on the back, and there's some discrepancies as to what it says. But um, I don't think we were ever really able to properly excavate the crash site because it was in Laos. And uh, there was a, a AAA group in Laos from the, the, the mil that the enemy operated, which shot down most of our planes that were flying towards North Vietnam. And uh, Doug was the one in, was the one who went went in, and on 75 times within a 10-month period, brought either somebody back that was dead or alive. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else?
There, oh, Luck is over here in the pink shirt. Good morning. My name is Luck Patterson, the brother of uh, Navy Lieutenant James Kelly Patterson. I was in the Marine Corps. I was a rifle platoon commander uh, fighting in the South at the same time that my brother was flying bombing missions over the North. Now, just to show you what kind of a little, I got a little story just to show you what kind of a brother he was. I'll keep it quick. Uh, he got some permission to, uh, the USS Enterprise pulled into Subic Bay for a little bit of downtime. He asked his commanding officer if he could go see his kid brother in Da Nang. Well, Da Nang in those days was something of a, an American city, really. Uh, now, he got permission, but I wasn't in Da Nang. I was out in the rice paddies. I was out in the bush, but he found his way to me just as I was preparing my platoon for a three-day com combat patrol, platoon-sized combat patrol. Now, not to be denied a, uh, a visit, uh, he went along with me. I issued him a, f a flak jacket and a helmet and an M16, and he actually participated in, marine, in a marine combat patrol. He was a navigator bombardier on A6 intruders, which was at the time the cutting edge of our technology. He was a wanted man by the Russians because he was getting by their defenses. He was putting bombs on the target during all kinds of weather. The Russians wanted to know what he did, when he did it, what stimulated him to do what he did so that they could create countermeasures. And here he was out in the bush, vulnerable to be captured by the Viet Cong and turned over to the Russians. About a, he went, he survived my, uh, my patrol. About a month later, he was shot down on uh, Ho Chi Minh's birthday, May 19, 1967. Uh, went missing on the 22nd. For 18 years, we didn't know anything about what was, anything about his, uh, about his missing status uh, from the Vietnamese. They finally opened up and said that he was killed. He said that on the 22nd of May, he was killed and he was buried on the spot. Uh, our people went there to that spot. Uh, with the Vietnamese witnesses, they said, dig here, we dug, and there's nothing there to indicate that anybody was ever buried there. In 1991, uh, there was a Soviet newspaper came out with the information, evidence, if you will, that has not been confirmed, that my brother was taken to the Soviet Kazakhstan where the Russians had, uh, had research facilities going on on missiles or what, what name it. That has not been confirmed. Um, so we're still, I'm still exploring that. I went to uh, Kazakhstan in 1990, went to Kazakhstan in 1997, in Vietnam in 1995, which that's why I'm here, still trying to find out what, uh, what happened to my brother. But that's the kind of a brother he was, a uh, highly trained naval officer came to participate as a participant in a, uh, in a marine uh, combat patrol. So I, uh, I thank God for his brotherhood. Thanks, Luck. My name is Natalie Anderson Rao. I'm here with my sister. Sherry Anderson Rungstead. Um, we have two younger brothers. Our dad is Colonel Warren L. Anderson, date of loss, 26 April 1966, also an F-4 pilot. I've heard quite a few F-4 identification in this morning. And what I love about this opportunity is everybody has a story. And so this is a chance for us to tell our stories. It's encouragement to each other, and I think it should be an encouragement to all of DPAA. I know you guys know this, that every case number has a family, but this is like a real reminder of that. And so I'm going to whittle it down to one story. In February of 1966, 
uh, my dad and his co-pilot had R&R. &R. Well, in that early in the war, you didn't come back to the U.S. I think they had the option of Taiwan or the Philippines. So they went to Taiwan, and our dad met Steve McQueen in a bar in Taiwan because he was there filming Sand Pebbles. And I think the statute of limitations has run out, but he did offer him a ride in an F4, <laughs> and, which never happened. I, as far as I know, it never happened. But um, that was just one of the very cool stories about our dad, and I know you guys could all share the same thing. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Penelope Gassman Gray. Um, my brother, Fred Gassman, um, volunteered to go into the Army. He was in Special Forces. Um, they were, his troop was on a, a mission in Laos, um, which of course we weren't supposed to be in Laos, so my parents thought it was in Vietnam until they could tell, they'd tell us that he was in Laos. And um, during the mission, um, they were attacked, his team was attacked, and my brother, they of course radioed for help, for rescue, and my brother and the leader of the team help the others be rescued. But my brother and the other leader of the team were, were killed. Um, and he was awarded a silver star for his bravery. And I've, my brother was always the champion of the underdog, always. If he thought someone was being wronged, he took up for them. And I was very proud of that. He was a gentleman, we were very close. Um, we were just three years apart in age. He was killed one month after his 23rd birthday. Um, and um, he, he was a newlywed. He had only been married two months before he went over. And I never could accept the fact that he was gone. I wanted to think he was being held prisoner and he'd be home. And I never found any comfort, anyhow, until Um, General Kelly, who was a previous chief of staff, his son was killed in Afghanistan. It's been several years ago now. And he said something that brought me some comfort. He said, if said, um, if my son had to do it all over again, he would have. He was proud of what he was doing. And I thought about that, and I thought, Fred would have done it again, too. And he had many friends and soldier friends who were South Vietnamese. And for some reason, that brought me comfort, knowing that he would do it again. And I'm just so, so proud of him. And even though it's been more than 50 years, it still hurts. It still hurts badly. And so I certainly feel for all of you um, who are going through such things. And I hope that this meeting continues. It needs to continue. Um, and we appreciate what is being done to find our loved ones. And I appreciate this opportunity to tell my story. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have five minutes on the money, so if anyone has brief remarks, if not, uh, since it came up several times, and I meant to do it before, there's 209 of you family members here today representing 103 losses. For comparison, last year we had 152 guests representing 72 losses. Can I have a, since it's come up several times, can I have a show of hands of who is here for the first time? Wow, that's quite significant. We're especially pleased that you all have joined us. Okay, I'm going to yield back the rest of my time, and I'm going to ask our director, Kelly McKegg, to uh, come up, please. Good morning, distinguished family members. For us in the Department of Defense, it truly is both a privilege and an honor for us to be able to gather with you to participate in these next two days, but more importantly, to connect with you. Natalie, I can assure you, we do not need to be reminded. But it, this purpose serves a great cause to reinforce when we talk to people about the inordinate numbers of missing from your loved one's conflict all the way back to World War II, the question I often get asked is, well, are these just numbers? Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you, not a single person in the Department of Defense treats these as just numbers. We have, been, we have not become inured to the daunting numbers, the passage of time. If anything, we're emboldened by it simply because we know deep in our hearts of what it means to you. Thank you for sharing both the stories, the memories. Heather, thank you, and Mark, and all the first-time family members for having the courage to resurrect hard times, challenging times, but more importantly, to come and connect with other family members, but more importantly, to tell us why this is important to you. Thank you also for sharing your frustrations, your disillusionments, and more importantly, thank you for demanding answers, because these answers are what you deserve. And I can assure you that we in the Department of Defense are doing everything humanly possible Sure, we make mistakes. Sure, we stumble. Sure, we make you mad and we frustrate you. But continue to hold us accountable simply because you are owed these answers because of the supreme sacrifice that your loved one made. I'd like to have a conversation with you this morning entitled, as you can see, if I could please, or is that me? For those of you that are Jeopardy fans, you can look at this as the category potpourri. I'm going to talk to you about a number of topics, all of which my colleagues will further provide details. But it's important for me to share with you the progress and also the challenges that we continue to face with the accounting mission for Vietnam War losses. As it has been for the last seven years, Vietnam War accounting among all the conflicts is and will remain our operational priority, our top operational priority. A lot of people ask me, why is that the case? Well, simply put, it's because it's the cases that we know the most about. We have been with you since the 80s. We've developed and we've gone back, oftentimes multiple times, to investigate, to excavate, to research. Another reason why it will remain the operational priority is simply because time is against us. First-hand witnesses are aging. First-hand witnesses are dying. 
And so it's up to us to be able to continue to do this in both a pace and scope that is worthy of finding you the answers that you deserve. I talked to you last year, the fact that we were successful in petitioning to the Department of Defense, that there was a moral responsibility to increase the resources attached to this mission. When DPA was stood up, there was no magic to the budget. It was just combining three former organizations' budgets into one budget. But that budget remained at that level for six years. Last year was the first time that the Department of Defense said, make your case, we did. Tell us why and how you would use this additional funding, and more importantly, what are the metrics, what are the outcomes that we as a department can expect? So our team did extraordinary work in putting this package together. This year, the appropriations bill that the Congress passed was the first year of five where that commitment, that financial commitment was laid in. Now granted, we didn't get that money until six months into the fiscal year because of the craziness that oftentimes happens here in this town. But nonetheless, we have it, and more importantly, we are putting it to good use. In fact, I would submit to you, we're putting it to great use. All of that money is being put against more research, against more investigations, against more field ex excavations for the express purpose of both progressing a case, but more importantly, God willing, finding the answers that you deserve. Because of our commitment to Vietnam War counting, we make it a point to send a senior leader forward to Southeast Asia to meet with the host nation officials. I went last year, our principal deputy director went this year. This is important because, again, it shows the commitment of the Department of Defense, the US government, in fulfilling its commitments, not just to you, but also to the host nation. And so we use these trips to, again, further and advance the mission in those host nation countries. Fern Sumter Woodbush had a very successful set of engagements in Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand. I'll point out in Laos' case, and I'll talk more about this here in a minute, we actually conducted the annual consultative talks a year, six months early. And we did so because of these next points I'm going to bring up. We've had challenges in Laos. So not only do these trips allow us to hopefully resolve challenges that crop up, but more importantly to express our appreciation to the host nations as to why this needs to be and will remain not only our priority, but hopefully theirs. And in all three cases, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, she and her delegation receive those commitments from the host nations. Now let me talk to you about Laos. For those of you that have loved ones in Laos, this has been vexing for us, to be frank. It's been vexing to us because we thought we, had, we were in a good place with the Lao in terms of a trajectory that we offered improvements, we offered efficiencies, effectiveness, initiatives, and over the course of time, I had seen this from my very first trip to Laos in 2012, I had seen this progression of increased cooperation. One thing that had been elusive for us is the fact that our US-based, our American, team that is based permanently in Vientiane, Laos, lack the diplomatic protections and immunities afforded to all, not just US diplomats, but any diplomat. We had mitigated this over the years, but each year we would tell the Lao, why can't we have this to protect and ensure the safety of not only our personnel, but their families. For instance, if they got into an accident, there's nothing we could do, there's nothing that the US embassy could do in terms of protecting their rights as diplomats. So we chose, I chose, 
to make this a compelling argument for the Lao. And we presented the fact that we've given you a proposal. Please accept this proposal to protect the ensure the safety of our personnel. Otherwise, we will cancel one joint field activity. We had already completed one, the first one for the fiscal year. This would be the second one. This turned out, regrettably, to be a game of two cars coming at each other, seeing which one will swerve. In the end, we ended up canceling three joint field activities, which is not helpful to us. It is certainly not helpful to you. Those three JFAs consisted of nine recovery teams and three investigation teams. An absolute tragedy for us. I could tell you that there are ongoing discussions, but there is still no full resolution. We can't continue to do this. So we are separating operations from this diplomatic protection issue. And we'll do so by mitigating as best we can any effects to the safety and welfare of our assigned personnel in Laos. Now, are there risks to this? Of course. But for us to continue to do this makes absolutely zero sense. So I'm pleased to report that the first operation of this pause will occur next month. It's one recovery team that we are repurposing from Papua New Guinea to work in Laos. We originally had three partner teams, three excavations that were, we were conducting next month. At those same consultative talks last month, the Lao, out of the blue, say they can't come without a diplomatic passport. Well, that doesn't make any sense. We'd had people like that before. Make a long story short, we are committed to not just resuming operations next month, but starting in October with the start of the new fiscal year, we will go back to having that robust schedule and the commitment of the Lao to conduct these operations. Was the pause regrettable? Yes. Did it get, did it achieve our objective? It did not. But in the end, it was about protecting and ensuring the safety of our personnel, which I think I would hope that you can understand. Vietnam is just the opposite in terms of cooperation that we get from the host nation. Just this week, 10 teams, six recovery teams, four investigative teams are coming home after having conducted a repatriation ceremony two days ago in Da Nang. And that robust footprint will continue as it has over the last few years because of some innovations that we, together with the Vietnamese, have put into place that continue to bear great fruit. Those 10 teams that are coming home left behind an underwater recovery team. This is another success story because for many years we had asked the Vietnamese, can we, can we extend the length of these joint field activities simply because mobilizing for 45 days with all the dive equipment and all the complexities of an underwater mission and then to tear it down and then come back again did not make any sense. So after wrangling, they've decided, and we're thankful for that, that these missions are now 60 days long. So that recovery team, that underwater recovery team and all those divers are continuing to operate and will come home in another two weeks. So very pleased with the cooperation that we continue to get from Vietnam. You all will recall, and I know some of you mentioned the fact that your mother was a founder of the National League. The League, that grassroots effort of mothers, wives, daughters, bore great fruit in the early 80s, reaching the desk of President Reagan, who committed to then, as you all know, to fullest possible accounting. First joint operations in Vietnam, 10 years after the war, 10 years before normalization. Think about that. 
And today, as my friend Jed Royal will talk about next, we enjoy the highest level of partnership with the Vietnamese government, what they call a comprehensive strategic partnership. Who would have thought that? But none of that would have occurred had not the Vietnamese trusted that cooperating with the United States on this mission in the midst of economic sanctions, in the midst of trade embargoes, would bear fruit as it has today. Vietnam, for those of you that have been, is a prosperous, secure, stable, peaceful country that enjoys these benefits simply because they trusted that cooperating with the United States on looking for your loved ones would be in their best interest. And here we are today, not only enjoying their cooperation, but also helping them stand up a capability to search for their missing loved ones. There was a big change this year where the Cambodian government changed governments for the first time in a long time. But the good news is, is that when Fern Sumter Winbush went to Phnom Penh, what she received from the government was the exact same staunch, steadfast commitment that had been made to us over the years, over the decades. Cambodia remains a very strong partner in terms of cooperation. We're very pleased with that. The number of missions that we have in Cambodia will continue to be a robust number. And more importantly, the new prime minister, when Ann Mills Griffiths and her delegation went to Phnom Penh, pledged his support, personal support, for helping America find its missing. That's not lost on us. Prime Minister Han Manet is a West Point graduate, so he understands and appreciates our military. But more importantly, as his father did, he is firmly committed. In fact, <laughs> it's funny, Anne relays that while she was there with the ambassador, he personally talked about a specific case. He knew the details. That was encouraging to us, that here we have the Prime Minister of Cambodia, not only have an interest, but also a knowledge, working knowledge, of what it is we do. This is a yin and a yang. Let's start with the negative. You all know that we have a U.S.-Russia Joint Commission on POW MIAs. It's been in existence since 1992. We've had great success over the years. We've had access to their archives. We've had technical talks with them. But since COVID, exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, this has atrophied to the point where there is limited, very limited activity with the Russian government when it comes to our losses. Now what's compelling about this is the fact that with Russia, we are looking at losses from all four conflicts, World War II through the Vietnam War. So what Russia knows, where Russia knows it, is very crucial to us. As regrettable as it is, I don't think it's hyperbole, hyperbole to state that we are on life support simply because all we have left in Russia are two contracted researchers. And those two contracted researchers, while they were denied access to the archives that they had been working in since January 1st, are fortunately still working the cases that they developed before they were moved out of the archives, and more importantly, working with open source material to again, hopefully advance cases when it comes to our losses in Russia. The converse is a good news story. We actually have resumed cooperation with China. Like Russia, losses in China span World War II through the Vietnam War. So the pause brought by COVID, which we understood, but never resumed simply because of the bilateral tensions is something that turned on a dime. 
And we're thankful that not just our US ambassador, Ambassador Burns, but also the Chinese foreign minister, nine months ago, now a year, made it a point to use this humanitarian effort as a door opener to say, despite what else might be going on in the world between the United States and China, this should be a carve up. We had progress. We were invited to send a team to two sites, World War II sites, in two provinces in January. That team was met not just by a warm welcome by the PLA escorts, but also by the villagers and the provincial officials. That was followed by an archival exchange in May. And from that archival exchange, that then led to what's coming up in August, which will be an excavation of one of those sites that had been looked at in January. And for the very first time, an investigation of three Korean War sites. So as Ambassador Burns puts it, we will look at this window and leverage this window, this open opportunity, as well and as hard as we can. But it's a great news story simply because, and I, I met uh, the Chinese ambassador, I'm sorry, the Chinese defense attache was here last night for the league's dinner, and I spoke to him, and unprompted, he came to me and said, isn't it great that your teams will be coming back in August? So there's knowledge all through the Chinese government. And he said, it's important for us to help you, this is his words, not mine, bring answers to those families. I thought, wow. But this is a senior military representative of the Chinese military assigned to Washington to their embassy saying that. Absolutely incredible. Thank you for this. This was a big deal. I end, it, I end with this simply because this is the ultimate answer. You all know this. This is the answer that every single one of us in the Department of Defense, not just DPAA, but the service casualty offices, AFMES AFDIL, the DNA Laboratory, DIA Stony Beach, we strive every single day to look and secure this for you. You'll hear from Dr. Nicolette Parr, who heads our Vietnam War Identification Project. She'll tell you why Vietnam War accounting is challenging, but nonetheless, the pluck that they apply, the tenacity that they apply, along with our partners at the Armed Forces, Medical, Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory, are truly extraordinary. These are world-renowned individuals, whether historians, whether scientists, archaeologists, anthropologists, and as renowned as they are as professionals, what sets them apart, and I can assure you, this will be my 10th year in this mission space. What sets them apart is not their professionalism, which is eye-watering. What sets them apart is their passion, their dedication, and their commitment to you. We know our existence is simply a matter of you and your loved ones. As I tell people, this is a sacred obligation. But it's also moral imperative. Your loved ones made the supreme sacrifice on behalf of their nation. The nation, and we're just an instrument of the nation, is obliged, morally obliged, to do everything humanly possible to give you these answers. Please continue to challenge us. Please continue to put your finger in our chest. But at the same time, please continue to tell us about your loved one. 
And I was struck this morning, listening to all of you, how powerfully poignant your sharing of your memories and your stories are. Heart-wrenching. And it is generational grieving that passes down simply because it's the loss that's exacerbated by the uncertainty. Well, we're here to reaffirm and commit to you that we are looking to remove the uncertainty wherever, however, whenever we can. God bless you all. God bless the shared mission that I know we care deeply about. And I know, as some of you pointed out, there is providential help that we, EPA, do not push back on or say we're not grateful for. God bless you all. So our next speaker I'm privileged to introduce is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. That's a mouthful. But my friend Jed Royal is a career civil servant whose professionalism, whose insights, whose talents, bar none, are extraordinary. He's had time working on a congressional committee. He's had multiple times in the National Security Council, at the Pentagon, and we are just very fortunate to have him today to share with you Department of Defense perspectives on the greater picture. Jed's realm is the entire Indo-Pacific region, stretching from Pakistan all the way out through Oceania and everything in between. A talented man. I benefit from the fact that I sit next to him at staff meetings at times, and I just pick the crumbs that he affords me every so often. Jed, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Jed Royal. Well, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be here. It is an incredible honor. Uh, to be able to address you today. And I just want to start off by saying there's power in these gatherings. Um, it means something, and I really appreciated hearing some of your stories as I was able to come into the room today. And, uh, and I don't take any of this uh, lightly. This is, just as uh, Director McKaig said, um, our sacred uh, and moral obligation. And so it's with that spirit that I come to provide you an update today on the uh, work that we're doing at a strategic level uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I want to thank all the private citizens who serve tire as tireless advocates for the fullest possible accounting for the missing and repatriation of the remains of those who died while serving our nation. Full accounting for all missing personnel is a sacred and essential mission. We must bring our missing personnel home to help provide families and loved ones closure. Director McKaig asked me to provide some of these strategic perspectives on our current approach in Southeast Asia and with Vietnam, with a focus on the elevation of the United States-Vietnam relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership that occurred last year. The President's Indo-Pacific strategy directs the U.S. government to prioritize strengthening our alliances and partnerships across the region in order to secure and support a free and open Indo-Pacific. We are currently experiencing a historical shift in the character of strategic relationships in the Indo-Pacific region. Secretary Austin was in Singapore for the annual Shangri-La Dialogue earlier this month, and he talked about a new convergence among Indo-Pacific states that is producing a stronger, more resilient, and more capable network of partnerships. This network is defining a new era of security in this region. But this network doesn't follow uh, uh, an, any extant model. It is unique to the Indo-Pacific region. It's not a single alliance, but a set of overlapping and complementary initiatives and in institutions propelled by a shared vision and a shared sense of mutual obligation. 
we are managing a range of security dilemmas together through this network. And why does it work? Uh, it's because we found common cause with so many in the region based on shared principles. Countries across the Indo-Pacific, including the United States, are converging around these enduring beliefs, respect for sovereignty and international law, the free flow of commerce and ideas, freedom of the seas and skies, openness, transparency, and accountability, peaceful resolution of disputes through dialogue, not coercion and conflict, and equal dignity for every person, including the deceased. And it is in that context that we are now seeing a new opportunity with Vietnam. As we engage with Vietnamese leadership, we are increasingly viewing our future together, one where we solve security and economic problems through partnership, and one where we communicate effectively about our interests and challenges and forge a combined path ahead. So last year, on September 10th, Vietnam's General Secretary Trong and President Biden met in Hanoi, and they hailed a historic new phase of bilateral cooperation and friendship by elevating our nation's relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership. Those are important words. They mean something uh, in terms of the elevation uh, and the responsibilities that come with that level of partnership. We're grateful for the increasing strategic alignment with Vietnam, which is remarkable in light of our history. The Department of Defense will continue to enhance our comprehensive partnership in the years ahead by, fo by focusing on practical defense cooperation, especially in areas of addressing the legacy of war, advancing defense trade, and sharing information. And so I am optimistic about the future, but that has only become possible because we have worked to address the challenges of the past. We are committed to an honest reckoning and a durable approach to uh, remediation and full accountability. For Secretary Austin and for all of us at the department, addressing the legacy of war is critical in the long process of healing the wounds of war and cementing the ties between our peoples. Both of these things are essential to achieving a positive and cooperative future together. We remain committed to that full accounting of U.S. personnel, con continuing the cleanup of dioxin, removing unexploded uh, munitions, and providing support to disabled veterans of the war. And we will not lose sight of this essential work, even as the characteristics and the relationships in the region continue to evolve. Since 2018, the Vietnam War Accountability Initiative has increased goodwill by helping Vietnam in its search for their missing from the Vietnam War including organizing millions of war records into a state-of-the-art database and promoting people-to-people -people exchanges. Our hope is that these initiatives might create additional ways and means to support a full accounting on both sides. The United States and Vietnam have made extraordinary progress over the last several decades in overcoming our past animosity and building a partnership that benefits our peoples. And this would have not been possible without the solid foundation and cooperation that was built by many of you here today who have worked diligently to account for our missing personnel. And because of your efforts, we have honored the sacrifices of the fallen, improved the lives of future generations, and built a strong partnership between our countries. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity. It's an extraordinary privilege to be here with you. Maybe just on a short personal note, I'd like to say that I have, in fact, a lot of uh, objectives and goals and missions um, in my uh, portfolio. This one hits differently. Uh, it means something different. I'm the son of a Vietnam War veteran myself, and I just really appreciate hearing the personal uh, comments from the families here. Uh, it is something that um, uh, I think of frequently and regularly as I continue in with the work that I do throughout the entire region. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your commitment. Uh, to all of this work. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Thank you. Sir. You just mentioned about removal of dioxin. So my brother's flight was a defoliation mission in Laos. Hmm. They've not found this crash site. And one of the subjects brought up is the Darn contamination. Can you speak to what's happening in Laos regarding yeah, thank you for that question. The question is related to dioxin remediation in Laos uh, in particular. Um, 
We, we have efforts underway, and we have, uh, as Director McKaig talked about, a bit of a frustrated relationship with Laos on some of these uh, engagements. Uh, we're continuing to try and pulse at that at the uh, bilateral, strategic bilateral level. We continue to remind our colleagues of the importance of this work. Uh, I'm afraid that this is um, sweating the details, and we're just going to have to continue to advance this step by step, every single uh, step of the way. We do have some, uh, we have resource initiatives that I think will allow us to fully conduct the work that needs to happen as soon as the opportunities exist for us. But I, I understand that there is um, challenges here uh, in, the, in the bilateral relationship that are frustrating some of these efforts. And so I don't have much more to update you on that at this point in time, but uh, I do hope, hope for the most and we will continue to make sure that we're lifting this issue up in our discussions with Laos. Yes, ma'am. Richard Walsh, also shot down in Laos. Um, as I said earlier, his, uh, the general area of his crash site is well known, and the, the uh, location where the engine hit the earth has been excavated multiple times. Um, um, it is now um, theorized that my father's body is about a football field away where they recently found the Yankee extraction system indicating perhaps a last minute attempt to, um, to uh, bail out. Um, in my update of, of his case, the efforts of the DPAA in connection with his case, um, there's always been a coupling of removing UXO and looking for remains. But in, in recent excavations, all they do is remove UXO, mm. you know. And, and my sense as a family member is that this legacy of war umbrella has far more activity on remo removing UXO and dioxin than it does recovering remains of Americans mm. um, when... Vietnam, for example, refers to their mission. I, I, of course, I sympathize with my fellow children of war dead in Vietnam, but I respectfully point out they won. The territory where their war dead is is under their control and authority, um, and I think we should focus on our war dead and recovering our remains. Always keep removing the, the UXO, but I, I regret and resent that recovering remains, in my father's case, is less and less an active goal. And I, I, I want to ask you to refocus on recovering remains of Americans. That has to be your first duty. Thank you very much for that comment. That's, um Appreciate that very much, and um, I can assure you that this remains uh, top of the list for us. I know that may not feel that way, uh, but I will personally look into making sure that the balance of attention is appropriate uh, going forward. Thank you for that comment. Yes, ma'am. I have a quick... Goodness. I have a quick question for you, and I think this is in your purview, even though it's not something you spoke about. Uh, but when we look at some of the policies of working with the host nations, you know, in Vietnam we have the 45-day limit, which now with underwater is 60 days. That's great. You know, in Laos we you know, had the North-South Protocol for years. There's all these things that we've just accepted as part of the working relationship, yeah. although they are very limiting. And I'm curious if there's ever any talk and focus on how to renegotiate some of that so that, you know, like, for example, we, we were a success story this past year, but having to go in and set up two different times for those 45 days and clean it up, get ready, come back for a while, go back mm -hmm. in. I'm just curious if when you're talking about different policies and how you're negotiating what's going on in these countries, if you're looking at some of those hand-me-down limitations and making some changes. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, I can't confess that I know much on the specifics of how the uh, actual events are set up um, and some of the efficiencies that I think that you're speaking about here to make sure that we can 
um, accomplish this mission as quickly as possible. Uh, by and large, my focus is to try to make sure that we have the political commitments that are necessary to allow the access uh, for these uh, missions. And I think in that regard, we're um, having fairly good success. I'll just mention in Cambodia, for example, I was in uh, Phnom Penh in February. I had a chance to meet with Prime Minister Hun Manet while I was there, and I had the opportunity to remind him of the importance of this mission set and ask him for continued support, in, in fact, increased support in Cambodia uh, for access uh, to be, make sure that we can continue to meet this mission. Uh, so that's, by and large, the, the focus of my effort here, but I think uh, I, I'm not terribly familiar with some of the details of the stand-up and breakdown. Hey, yeah. Kind of under your purview that having that level of conversation with the host government on how that's conducted? Yeah, so the, the specific missions DPAA runs, uh, and we are in partnership with them to make sure that we're doing everything we can on the political and the um, um, policy side of the House to ensure they have all the access necessary uh, to do that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Sir. Uh, Director McKay, describe what uh, our relationship with Laos. Mm. Essentially uh, uh, described uh, what I interpreted as a game of chicken mm. uh, with yes, you can, no, you can't. Um, and somebody is going to blink. Have we blinked? No, sir. We have not blinked. So we, the, the October reference that he made to things moving with more uh, alacrity um, is good. I mean, is, is that going to happen because we blinked or they blinked or somebody blinked? <laughs> uh, I... I don't, I don't believe that there is any blinking going on on the U.S. side. <laughs> to be very clear, we continue to make sure that this is a talking point that is addressed every single opportunity that we have to make sure that we are uh, uh, doing everything we can to encourage them politically to move forward uh, to provide the access that we need. So, uh, sir, I, I know that this is a, a frustrating uh, development and we're not where we want to be in the policy and the political relationship with Laos. We are continuing to make sure that it is a priority effort for us going forward. And that includes for Secretary Austin as well. Um, sir. Good morning. My name's Karen Stedman. I'm the daughter of Captain James E. Stedman. He was an F-4 pilot to Night Owl. He's an off-the-scope case. Um, hi. Um, my question is, in Laos, I know some private citizens who have been going over there for the last three to five years, and the landscape's getting changed drastically with agriculture. They're plowing over crash sites and things like that. Um, how's that gonna help us ever get any answers? Yeah, uh, thanks for that uh, question. Um, I I wish I had more opportunity to uh, affect the way that the uh, Laotian government is managing their own real estate. Um, uh, we, I think your point is, um, what I take from your point is that time is not on our side. We have to move quickly. We have to address these things quickly. And therefore, the requirement to sustain the very senior level, high level engagement on these issues is absolutely critical. You have my commitment that we will continue to do that on our side and, and make every effort possible here. But I fully understand and appreciate the um, changing landscape dynamics do frustrate our ability to recover the remains. And I guess in our country, if there's a construction activity happening and remains are found, we stop, we do our theology things. I'm sure that's not happening over there. Is it, the Chinese don't really care if they come across grass lights? It, yeah, I would defer to DPAA who will know more of the details on uh, how that's uh, going right now within Laos, but I um, assume that their rules and regulations are, are a bit different than ours. Um, but in any event, the main point being that I think you need a commitment from me that we will continue to make sure uh, that we move into this as quickly as possible. There is not time to waste. We need to make sure that we're addressing this consistently uh, and at the highest levels, we'll continue to do that. I think I 
am getting the hook back here. Uh, again, I want to thank you very much uh, for being here. That is the most important thing. Uh, gathering in this way is powerful, and we appreciate it in the Pentagon. I come to work every single day, and I drive by uh, Arlington Cemetery on my way in, and I often hear uh, the cannon and gun salutes uh, as they're going off at Arlington Cemetery in the morning. It means a lot to me to be a part of this mission uh, and your presence here, your commitment to one another uh, and to your family and your loved ones uh, is powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much for your commitment. Thank you. All right, can, can everybody hear me? Can you guys hear me? All right, there it goes. All right, so uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Colonel Matt Brandon. I'm the Deputy Director for Operations. I see we have a pretty large uh, group of first-time family members, so you'll hear from me tomorrow, and we'll talk a, lot, a, a little bit about some of the questions that you're asking today, uh, the mission sets, the skill sets that we have, uh, address how we address those problems of agriculture development and other development. So uh, bear with us, and uh, you'll hear from me tomorrow. I'll talk a little bit more. But sir, uh, on behalf of Mr. McCaig, uh, we just want to present you with the poster for our National POW MIA Recognition Day. Uh, so for those that don't know, this is really an effort uh, put together by some of our enlisted service members really to honor the sacrifice and, and recognize our efforts to earnestly search for your missing loved ones. Uh, we just appreciate the support from you, sir, and IPSA, and the continued advocacy that you give for us to be able to execute this mission. So thank, thank you, you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And I'm going to turn it back over to Mike Fowler here who will introduce our next speaker. All right. So now we're going to hear from Mr. Gregory Poling from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's the Senior Fellow and Director of Southeast Asia. And he's going to be discussing na navigating challenges and opportunities in Southeast Asia. Come on up, Greg. Uh, thank you, Mike, uh, for the kind introduction and, and the kind invitation. Uh, and thank you all so much for giving me some of your time this morning. Like the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, this is somewhat personal to me as well, as I think it is to most families in the United States. My father was a veteran. He deployed in 68. Uh, I think it's hard to find a family in the United States who hasn't been touched by the war in one way or another. And too often we forget that that impact is intergenerational. It didn't end uh, in the 90s with normalization, and it's not going to end anytime soon. So this is a, a considerable honor and something very special for me. I speak to a lot of groups here in Washington, but, but very few in which I feel a, a certain moral obligation and weight like I do in this one. So uh, as Mike said, I direct the Southeast Asia program around the street here at CSIS, which is the biggest nonpartisan foreign policy think tank here in Washington. We're also uh, the largest Southeast Asia program. I've been over there since 2011. Uh, I started as our Vietnam researcher um, long before they asked me to, to run the program. And the very first analytical report I ever worked on at CSIS was on the military medical agreement that the US and Vietnam signed in 2011. The first time we had ever signed a military agreement was Vietnam. And I think it helped set a, a milestone for us to conceptualize just how remarkable the progress in the bilateral relationship has been. And I'll say, I, I'll address Laos and Cambodia a bit, but mostly I'm going to focus on the U.S.-Vietnam relationship because it's so central uh, in U.S. policy in the region at the moment. We didn't normalize diplomatic ties with Vietnam until 1996. Zero formal diplomatic relations of any kind, zero military relations, uh, very, very little economic interchange. By 2011, we were signing military agreements. It was only in 2016 that it became legal for the United States to trade arms with Vietnam. The arms embargo was in place until the twilight days of the Obama administration. So really, the fully normalized military relationship is eight years old. Eight. And yet, last fall, President Biden flew to Hanoi, as you heard earlier. Uh, signed a comprehensive strategic partnership with the Vietnamese government, General Secretary Nguyen Phu Chum, the highest formal level of diplomatic relations that Vietnam has. 
Now that sounds like a lot of jargon here in the U.S., and it somewhat is, uh, but Vietnam still maintains a pretty rigid Leninist hierarchy for how it, it feels about other countries. The United States is now at the top of that list, uh, alongside Russia and China, who joined about 15 years ago, but also alongside Japan, Australia, South Korea, India. Vietnam has been very rapidly, for the last 10 years now, trying to diversify its traditional relationships, minimize its dependence on Beijing and Moscow, and be embraced by the wider international community, and in particular the West. And the U.S. has responded to that call. Vietnam is probably the third, maybe closest strategic partner the U.S. has in the region at the moment, trailing only behind our treaty ally, the Philippines and Singapore, which is vital to U.S. deployments in the region. There's an enormous amount of trust, people-to-people -people exchange, economic exchange that goes both ways. The United States is Vietnam's largest uh, export market. Two-way trade in the last year we had good data, which was 2022, uh, was $125 billion from effectively $0 30 years ago. You can talk to any company here in Washington or anywhere else in the States. Vietnam is their probably number two focus right now after India. Every company trying to get out of China is looking to Vietnam. And that attention has helped open Vietnam ever wider. Um, on the people-to-people -people stuff, you know, in addition to addressing the legacies of the war, the bedrock of our people-to-people -people relationship has been educational exchange. From the founding of the first uh, Fulbright program with the support of Harvard, now 30 years ago, to the establishment of Fulbright University in Ho Chi Minh City. Today, Vietnamese citizens study in the U.S. at a higher rate than any of their counterparts anywhere else in Southeast Asia. There were approximately 100, almost 100,000 Vietnamese students studying in the U.S. over the last four-year period that the Department of Ed released stats, contributing about a billion dollars to the U.S. economy. And all that, again, builds that trust, that people-to-people -people trust that regardless of differences in the regimes, regardless of the ups and downs of official relations with the Vietnamese government, have helped underpin all the cooperation, military, economic, political, and social, that have gone underway in the last 30 years. And I think for both sides, it helps spine the wounds of the war. Um, you know, Gallup just released its uh, annual world opinion survey. They do these in 130 or 140 countries around the world. And, you know, every year they ask questions. Do you trust the U.S.? How do you feel about the U.S.? Do you trust China? Do you trust Russia? Uh, would you like to guess what the highest approval ratings for the United States anywhere in Southeast Asia are? They're in Vietnam. It's not in the Philippines. It's not in Thailand, certainly not in Singapore. Uh, Vietnam gives the U.S. a net 47, which means 47% more Vietnamese approve than disapprove. When you count that, that's more like 85% total of Vietnamese approve of the U.S. That's a lot higher than the U.S. gets here in the U.S. It's a lot higher than we get in Canada. It's like triple what we get in any European ally. It's even higher than the Philippines, which is number two in the region. So, again, there is an enormous... and. I mean, frankly, almost inexplicable degree of warmth and trust among the Vietnamese public toward the United States. That's also shared broadly by the Vietnamese government. I can't psychoanalyze individual Vietnamese leaders. I don't know what Wen Phu Cham thinks about the U.S. I don't know what new President To Lam thinks. But in annual elite surveys, which are sent out to Vietnamese government officials, business leaders, civil society leaders, Vietnam again uh, reports the highest level of trust and support for the United States anywhere in the region. The Institute for Southeast Asia Studies, which is based in Singapore, puts out one of these every year. This spring, their 2023 version, found that 79% of Vietnamese government and business elites said that in any conflict between the U.S. and China, Vietnam should side with the U.S. 79%, second only to the Philippines. Far higher than we would get anywhere else in the region. And this has been growing quite rapidly. Those Gallup numbers I cited, the you know, sky-high approval for the U.S., those are up a net 78 points in the last 15 years. So basically from the start of the Obama administration through to today, regardless of who has been in office on either side, there's been a straight line in Vietnamese approval for the United States, underpinned by this growing relationship, which helps facilitate everything else we do. Now, 
a lot of this is due to effort, very proactive effort by officials and diplomats, individual business people, scholars, veterans organizations, et cetera, on both sides. It also has a lot to do with China. You know, when you ask Vietnamese citizens and elites about external threats, nobody views the U.S. as a threat. The wounds of the war are still very real, but they don't echo into current strategic perceptions of Vietnam. China does. The Vietnamese public is well aware that Vietnam spends the last 2,000 years fighting China off and on. Vietnam's the only country on Earth that can claim that it defeated three members of the, National, of the, the UN Security Council, most recently China, in 1979. Mm -hmm. The only two senior officials in the entire Chinese government with any combat experience got it in Vietnam when they were mauled in northern Vietnam and pushed back. When you look at Vietnamese threat perceptions, China's number one, everything else is a distant second. And that growing anxiety about Beijing has been a tie that really lifts all boats. It makes things that would have been considered impossible 10 years ago very, very possible in the Vietnamese government. It leads even old party apparent cheeks and public security bureau officials to embrace a new relationship with the US because China is the real boogeyman in the region. South China Sea is a, the leading example of this, but not the only one. You know, Vietnamese forces fought China last in the South China Sea in 1988. They've been boarded, beat up, rammed, and attacked by China on a monthly basis for at least the last 10 years. That has built up a huge degree of support for maritime security cooperation with the US. It explains why two cycles ago, we had Vietnamese participation in the Rim of the Pacific Naval Exercise for the first time. We've got US aircraft carriers that pull into Vietnamese ports about once a year now. We've got US Coast Guard personnel based at the embassy working hand in glove with Vietnamese counterparts. This stuff flies under the radar, but it's extremely important. It builds that connective tissue between the two militaries and the two governments that facilitates everything else. Um, let me briefly address Cambodia and Laos, uh, and then I'd welcome any questions. Uh, Cambodia is quite a different story, obviously. Cambodia was supposed to be the good news story. Right? With the conclusion of the Paris Peace Accords now over 30 years ago, Cambodia was supposed to be a success story for the West and the UN overall. The peace building effort, the creation of a democracy that was supposed to function, bringing together all factions after the end of the war, has fallen apart. Uh, Cambodia's democracy has really not existed for almost 10 years now, ever since the Cambodian government decided to disband the CNRP, the opposition, and put tanks into the streets of Phnom Penh in 2015 after they had lost their congressional majority. Uh, Cambodia is an autocracy. It's an autocracy that holds elections, but it's an autocracy. Um, and that has led to an obvious chill in the U.S. relationship. You know, one of the things that people have trouble understanding, and Cambodians have trouble understanding, they'll say, well, you know, Vietnam is an autocracy. Sure, but the U.S. tends to view these things in relative terms. It's not where you are, it's where you started and where you're going. And Cambodia has been in absolute freefall. Yes, we have a new government that took power last year with Prime Minister Hun Manet, but Hun Manet is the eldest son of former Prime Minister Hun Sen, and every other member of the cabinet is either the son or daughter of the person who held that position uh, previously. It's the first and only that I know of modern example of an entire generation of new bureaucrats being elevated. It's effectively a feudal system in which if you're not born into a powerful family in Cambodia, you might as well not even try. Um, and that has put a real chill on the relationship. It doesn't help that the Cambodian People's Party, its legitimacy is derived in large part from the patronage it can give out, the corruption that underpins the rule. And where does that patronage come from? It mainly comes from China these days. So Cambodia, for the last 10 years, has fallen ever farther into China's orbit simply because the ruling party doesn't have many other options. That's why now we have a, effectively a Chinese naval base operating in Cambodia. Now, nobody's willing to say that Riem Naval Base in Cambodia is a Chinese naval base, but as my team at AMTI published just last month, there have been two Chinese warships docked at it for seven months and counting. China built the entire facility. There is housing there holding Chinese personnel who have been there probably for a couple of years now. 
why would Cambodia, whose constitution explicitly forbids the presence of foreign troops given its searing experience during both Vietnam and the Vietnamese invasion, allow Chinese forces to permanently garrison one of its military bases? Well, it's because it needs China. It needs China because it has no alternatives. Now, Secretary of Defense Austin was just in Cambodia uh, some well, a little over a week ago trying to feel out pragmatic cooperation with the new Hun Manet government, and I think that, that is smart. Hun Manet is not his father. He might come from the same nepotistic network, but he was West Point educated. He spent plenty of time in the U.S. He is perhaps more reasonable. Um, and more importantly for us, we have to view this as a long-term investment. If we look at that same Gallup survey I cited, uh, you know, how do you feel about U.S. versus how, to, how do you feel about China? In Cambodia, the Cambodian public reports 43% more relative support for the U.S. than China. It is the fourth best ratings we get anywhere in the region, uh, following Vietnam, Philippines, and Myanmar. Better than Singapore, better than Indonesia, better than Thailand, another U.S. treaty ally. The Cambodian public is deeply, deeply antagonistic toward China and deeply supportive of closer ties with the United States, views the U.S. as that beacon of democracy that, you know, so few places still seem to. And as we enter a new generation of leadership in Cambodia, the old revolutionary generation of Hun Sen and his ilk leave the scene, they're going to have to become more responsive to public opinion. Hun Manet and these other princelings, they do not command the same degree of legitimacy, the same uh, national, uh, you know, uh, reflexive uh, subservience that, that their fathers could. And so there will be increasing space for Cambodian civil society, for political organizations. The more the U.S. can remain engaged, the more the U.S. will be there when the wheel inevitably turns. And it will turn. It turns everywhere. It just takes longer than we're often comfortable with. With Lao, I don't have a lot to say. I will note it may surprise you that Laos also the Laos citizens report more support for the U.S. than China, but by a much narrow, narrower margin. In general, both China and the U.S. are quite popular in Laos. Um, the Lao regime remains relatively closed, deep U.S. engagement, at least the kind of engagement that we've seen with Vietnam and the rest of the region. Uh, we have seen the use of UXO remediation as a lever that has opened up some space. When I started uh, in this field now 13, 14 years ago, uh, groups like Legacies of War were fighting to get a million dollars in the annual budget for UXO removal uh, in Laos. Now there are multiples above that and continuing to grow. But other than the UXO issue, it's kind of hard to find a, a success story. We also have to be quite worried about Laos's agency these days. Laos has allowed China to build its first ever high-speed rail across the entire country, cutting the country in two, that really only makes economic sense for China. It's never going to turn a profit. Uh, China now controls Laos's entire electricity grid. Electricity to Lao was handed over to a Chinese state-owned enterprise because of debt burden. Just this week, the Lao government reported that they only have 10% of the cash on hand they need to service their interest on debt, most of which is held by China this year. So China has Laos hanging over a cliff. The only thing that keeps the entire Lao government from falling into sovereign default is because China doesn't let it. And that means that there's not a whole lot that Vientiane can do without Chinese approval. Um, but nonetheless, we have seen pragmatic cooperation with Laos succeed. We just have so they have much more limited scope. Uh, of what we can do with Vientiane than what we can do in, in Hanoi or even with, with Phnom Penh. Um, and I am aware that we're already running behind today, so maybe I'll just conclude there and I would welcome any questions you have uh, about U.S. policy overall or what we get up to here at the think tanks. Thank you. I saw it too. Yes, sir. Well, you described uh, robust uh, exchanges between the U.S. and Vietnam. Um, is, is that, uh, can you describe that, the cultural and, and educational exchanges with uh, Laos and Cambodia as well? 
So we have certainly seen a boom, not so much in Laos. Uh, there's, just, there's not a large number of Laos students going abroad, Laos businessmen going abroad, et cetera. With Cambodia, certainly. Um, and you have a very similar interaction you do with Vietnam where you have both uh, visiting students and business people coming in and interacting in sometimes complicated ways with uh, Khmer Americans who, who live here. The numbers are much smaller, both overall and as a percentage of the population. We haven't had the same history of educational exchange and government supported educational exchange that we saw with Vietnam. Um, we, you know, efforts to, to roll up debt owed to the U.S. into educational programs was a big part of normalization. Um, and we've also had, well, frankly, a lot more success by China in attracting Cambodian students. So you get more Cambodian students studying in China than studying in the U.S., although most still prefer to go to places like France. Whereas in Vietnam, it's something like one eighth the number in China. There's just no interest. There's, you know, Part of this comes down to cost uh, and ease and visa issues, but a lot of it just comes down to preference. Nobody in Vietnam wants to go get a degree in China. Yes, sir. What is Vietnam's motivation for cooperating so much with us? Hmm. Um, I think two things. So ever since the really going all the way back to the doi moi economic reforms of 1986, the Vietnamese Communist Party's legitimacy rests in large part on delivering prosperity and economic growth. And that has mandated a progressive opening to the world, opening to foreign investment, opening to development assistance, opening to trade. The U.S. is a growing investment partner. Anybody here who's using a Samsung phone right now, it was almost certainly built in Vietnam. I mean, Vietnam is a huge part of the international supply chain system, and that mandates that Vietnamese officials continue to, within reason, I mean, they're not going to, you know, this is not going to be a, a completely open market anytime soon, but within reason, work with the U.S. and other Western countries to meet the demands of business and, and so on. Um, the second component is that threat perception of China. Uh, you know, the saying in Vietnam, Vietnam is shaped the way it is because of 2,000 years of having China on its back. I would argue that you know, nations are made by the stories that we tell our children. The story you get told in kindergarten in Vietnam is why you don't speak Chinese. And so anybody who's going to be useful in ensuring that Vietnam never falls too deeply into a Chinese orbit is going to be seen as a critical partner. And there is no other pole in the system other than the United States that can give Vietnam that space. Um, this is a really quick question. Can you uh, confirm or deny whether or not China is building a dam in Laos on the tri border? Um, a dam, I'm not sure. China is building the Funan Teco Canal uh, in Cambodia, which will flood much of the tri border. So the Funan Teco Canal, in addition to potentially having real security concerns for Vietnam, because it could Hypothetically, this would allow uh, ships to sail up from the Gulf of Thailand straight to Phnom Penh without having to go through Vietnam to get upriver. This would bring uh, Saigon, among other parts of, of South Vietnam, hypothetically into range of, of Chinese boats. It would also have huge surveillance implications, but the real problem is that it will completely wreck the seasonal flooding that so much uh, agriculture, both around the Tonle Sap in Cambodia and on the Vietnamese side of the border, are dependent on. And so far, the Cambodian government has not been receptive to those concerns. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. So again, this is uh, on behalf of Mr. McCaig and the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, uh, just our framed uh, recognition folder. We really appreciate you sharing uh, some navigating some challenges and uh, which we all try to turn into opportunities. Uh, the information that we get, you know, we have a plans and policy directorate. Uh, some of our desk officers are sitting around the room. Raise your hand so you can see. Uh, so they really engage with these folks. Uh, we engage at all levels. So we have an understanding of uh, the geopolitical situation that's going on, and it helps us as leaders, as senior leaders, like Ms. Sumter Winbush, myself, and Mr. McCaig, as we travel, uh, really helps us understand uh, the perspectives. Uh, so we're not only sharing our own initiative, but also understanding the, the U.S. government's uh, larger goals uh, throughout the region. 
Um, and that really just helps us as we try to advance this mission. So we really appreciate all that you do over there. I appreciate you sharing some time with us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, our next uh, talk is going to be Insights on Vietnam-U.S. Relations. I'm pleased to call forward Ambassador Ving, former Ambassador of Vietnam to the U.S. and President of the Vietnam-U.S. Society. Give him a big round. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm very much honored to be here, and uh, certainly I thank the DPAA for the invitation. Uh, this time I travel over here, I remember 10 years ago, I started my job as ambassador of Vietnam to the US, so already 10 years. But during that point in time, I, can be, I, I was able to work with the DPAA, with the different light agencies here on the question of war legacy, and also with the legal of the families of uh, persons missing in action. Uh, my heart and thoughts continue to be here uh, in this solemn mission between Vietnam and the US. I was asked to speak about Vietnam-US relations, and I think uh, our colleague Derek Grossman has been mentioned a lot about it also. So I will speak in uh, the context of not only Vietnam-US relations, but also how it improved and how it facilitated uh, our job here in uh, working together on the world legacy issues. Actually, the Vietnam-US relation has been traveling a long journey. And I want to, if we look back, I want to mark last year. Last year, 2023, was the 10th anniversary of our relationship of the our relationship of comprehensive partnership, and that period of 10 years was uh, the fastest growth in our relationship. And among other things, we have been number one, enhancing our political exchange and diplomatic uh, engagement. Number two, our economic relations and ties have been strengthened, especially in trade, investment, and uh, in others. The trade figures that has been given by Derek Kurtzman also tell us how much we have been doing together. But one thing is that over the last 10 years, Vietnam and US trade, two-way trade, has been uh, growing 40 times from some 30 billion US dollars to more than 120 billion US dollars today. And suddenly, uh, the people-to-people -people exchange has been enhanced also. Derek Grossman also mentioned about the number of students studying here in the US. We send more and more students over here, not only by the government, but by the families, uh, according to their personal choice. So the US is a very much favored uh, destination for uh, the families to send students over here. And we rank number one in Southeast Asia to have in the numbers of students that we have here, and number six across the world with regard to other rich uh, countries. We also enhance our, certainly our cooperation on the world legacy issues that I will be touching upon it later on in more details. Uh, but last year, 2023, is also much more important because there was a landmark uh, uh, achievement between Vietnam and the US in their relations. President Biden visited Vietnam in September last year, and the two of us have agreed on upgrading our relationship to the highest level, as mentioned, of, uh, of Vietnam's foreign relations, that is 
the comprehensive strategic partnership. Among the things that we talk about when we develop the framework, the new framework of comprehensive strategic partnership, number one, we will strengthen our political engagement and also uh, deepen the principles that guide our relationships that includes also uh, the respect for uh, political, each other's political system. And number two, uh, we will continue to deepen our ties in economic and investment and trade areas. But this time, we open new opportunities for cooperation, including in green energy transition, including in uh, technology and innovation-based uh, development that includes also uh, uh, semiconductor areas. And we also are working together to ensure uh, and enhance the resilience of the supply chains amid the fluctuations of the world market and supply uh, disruptions. And people-to-people -people ties continue to be there and very much important to us. But one thing, the world legacy issue was very much a critical point and crucial part of our overall relationship. What I want to try to, to, to say is that if we look back not only 10 years, but look back 50 years of our relationship since the end of the war, then we will see step by step we have overcome uh, differences, we have come to understand each other more, but more importantly, deepening understanding, enhancing people-to-people -people ties, working together by enhancing uh, political exchange, we have deepened our political trust and people-to-people -people trust. This is very much important for, for us. Why we, at the same time, why we are enhancing and strengthening our relationship, we ex uh, we're expanding, we are expanding also our area of shared interests, including cooperation of bilateral nature and cooperation regarding uh, the region of Indo-Pacific and also the world. And I think that uh, political trust and confidence between Vietnam and the US will continue to be there and continue to be deeper. Now, talking on the world legacy issue, I must say that this is a crucial part and partial of our relationship. Throughout the years, we have been achieving enormous progress that has been highlighted by the TPPA, not only today, but also in other occasions. And one of the things that we have to think is that both of us think this is an, uh, a, a noble mission, a solemn mission of humanitarian nature, Vietnam and the US working effectively uh, together uh, uh, at policy level and also at the operational level. The US has uh, been increasing its assistance to Vietnam, including assistance to the people affected by the war, but also uh, to the environment, including the cleaning of the two projects, big projects on cleaning of the airports in Da Nang and now uh, airports in, in Bien Hoa. Vietnam continues to consider this one as an important one and continue to work effectively and fully and closely with the US side on uh, the MIA issue. Uh, last year, uh, we commemorated 50 years of what we call the Vietnam Office for Seeking Missing Actions. This is the focal point that we worked together with you in fighting the American remains. And, and it was established in March uh, 1973. This is very much early after the end of the war, and we continue to be working uh, closely with the US through this office as well. And the office is coordinating the lie agencies concerning Vietnam, especially the foreign ministry, uh, the public sector ministry, and the defense ministry. And also last year, we commemorated 35 years of our joint activities. The first joint activities was 
done uh, in uh, 1988. So 35 years we have been working together on uh, choice excavation and, and search. Uh, during that ceremony, we have paid tribute to all people who have been working together to make this uh, solemn mission going further forward, meeting the expectations of the families on both sides, Vietnam and the US. But at the same time, we pay tribute to uh, those who have made policies and environment for us to, uh, uh, to facilitate us in, in our job uh, today. Now, that the US and, and, and Vietnam has upgraded our relationship to the highest level of comprehensive strategic partnership, is not only expanding our shared goals with regard to bilateral relations, our shared interest to uh, bilateral relations, but also with regard uh, to the region of Indo-Pacific. At the same time, uh, it creates uh, enormous momentum for us to work together on different areas of cooperation, including in this very much important uh, area of war legacy issues. And Vietnam continues to support and to work effectively with the US on this issue, as you said, until the final account of those persons missing in action. We try to do that together with you. For me, uh, I've been working long uh, on the US-Vietnam relations. My first trip abroad as a young diplomat was here in New York and I joined the delegation to the UN back in 1983. At that point in time, the relationship of our two nations was still difficult. I was posted in New York twice during the 1980s and during the 1990s. And my last posting was here uh, from uh, 2014 to 2018. So uh, not only, uh, though I work in different areas, including multilateral and bilateral, but uh, the U.S. is there that I continue to work. Uh, now, as current chair, a uh, current president of the Vietnam U.S. Society, which is an organization that, that is in charge of people-to-people -people relations and ties uh, on the part of Vietnam with regard to the U.S. So, uh, we will continue to be there, not only on behalf of the government of Vietnam when they continue to work closely with you, but also for me as part of the Vietnam-US uh, society, we continue to be a partner of you. And certainly, we need to work together until uh, the expectation and the goal of our solemn mission is achieved. We are committed to work with you. We are committed to uh, uh, cooperate with you. Uh, and we need your assistance as well. So we share the feelings of our loved ones uh, about our loved ones on both sides, and uh, this is very much part of our mission. Thank you very much, then. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, those thoughts with us. As you were speaking, I thought there was a Franciscan monk named Father Richard Rohr who said, uh, pain that is not transformed is transferred. Uh, and I believe that uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Vietnam has been transformative since the war. So we really appreciate the support you guys give us in country Thank and you uh, present much. you with this. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. Whenever you go to Vietnam, please call me. Thank you. All right, well, I guess I can just take it from here. Mike, are you good? Because uh, I think I am uh, keeping you between uh, lunch. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you, uh, lunch, uh, 1.30. Uh, be back uh, for the next brief. Uh, so we'll take a pause here. You're welcome to hang out. Uh, if you have any questions, I can, I'll hang out here for a few minutes. Uh, if anybody who asks questions during the briefs uh, would like to follow up, uh, let me know. But we'll definitely address those in the Q&A later today. Thanks so much.